So I figured it out. The cure to racism. I mean, who better to whitesplain economic racism than a white guy? I don't know why anyone didn't think of this before. This episode is adapted from our most downloaded UNFTR podcast to date. And I think one of the reasons for its success is because it tackles widely held misconceptions by people that look like me and pulls back the curtain on conversations that aren't really held in mixed company, so to speak. In other words, we speak the quiet parts out loud to bust a few dangerous myths. Now, most black people know this information, mind you. Some of the historical elements might be new, but the prevailing themes and sentiments are indeed very familiar to the black community. So this is really for white people, well-intended or otherwise. Now, maybe you're uncomfortable having hard conversations about race or haven't thought all that deeply about racism or were too afraid to even ask the question. So that's point number one. When you're trying to understand something that's this entrenched and malignant, you can't be afraid to ask hard questions, even if they border on offensive. That's how we learn. Number two, there are no absolutes here. Just a mosaic of experiences, emotions, and circumstances that paint a picture that once you see it, can't be unseen. So white folk, you ready for this? Let's get uncomfortable. UNFTR. The night of the massacre, I was awakened by my family. My parents and five siblings were there. I was told we had to leave and that was it. I will never forget the violence of the white mob when we left our home. I still see black men seen being shot, black bodies lying in the street. I still smell smoke and see fire. I still see black businesses being burned. I still hear airplanes flying overhead. I hear the screams. I have lived through the massacre every day. Let's begin with the difficult questions and sentiments that you've all either heard or might have even uttered yourself. Every other immigrant group in this country was able to break out of the ghetto within one generation. Why can't black people? It's easier for black people to get a job or be accepted to college these days. Black people commit more crime and come from broken homes. They have to fix themselves, no one else can. Slavery isn't an excuse anymore, clean slate. One of their own became president, so they can't complain anymore. I worked my ass off to get here, and they just look for handouts. And then my favorite, they need to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Even the most well-intentioned, liberal-minded white person has had these thoughts or been around these discussions. It's okay. Most people don't see themselves as racist. Now, most people didn't build the system that subjugates people of color. Most people are just doing their best to get by and don't have the time to contemplate the answers to these questions. It's okay. If you've made it this far into the video already, you've probably fallen into this category and want to understand these issues at a deeper level, and that's a good thing. So we open the show with a clip from then 107-year-old Viola Fletcher's testimony in 2021, recounting the Tulsa massacre and the burning of what's become known as Black Wall Street in 1921 living history that connects us to our shared past, which we'll explore in more detail. Now, the Tulsa massacre was notable for its stark brutality. An entire district, generational wealth, buildings, savings accounts, land deeds, gone in a flash of hatred. It's a pretty straightforward example of an extremely complicated history. Now, these days, we're not really built for complicated. Short attention spans have disabled the parts of our brains that think critically and question authority. It's why we respond to phrases like, make America great again, trickle down economics, the silent majority, cut taxes on the rich, the free market and the invisible hand, tax and spend, job killers, lock her up, America first, looting, inner city, thugs, illegal immigrant, radical Muslim, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. And when we want to counter these dangerous encoded sentiments, we wind up using words like systemic, structural and institutional. Now, you know what you mean, right? I mean, maybe you've really studied this shit. And so you use words with deep meaning that are just too broad for others who can more easily remember a bumper sticker slogan. So to most, these are throwaway words, language of the pompous and elite 
institutional poverty, structural inequality, systemic racism. I mean, what the fuck did these words even mean to someone working a nine to five job wondering if they can put their kid through college without six figure debt? Or maybe how the hell they're gonna afford the prescription drug they were just denied for the 15th time by their insurance company. They're not looking to do their homework. They're just looking for someone to blame. To understand the meaning behind structural, institutional, and systemic, we'll walk carefully through post-emancipation history to reveal why the economic challenges that have always and still face the black community in the United States are entirely different than any other ethnic group. So let's start by revisiting Ms. Fletcher's testimony and the burning of Black Wall Street. Newly emancipated black people migrated to Tulsa, Oklahoma after the Civil War during the nation's westward expansion. By 1910, black people made up 10% of the population of Tulsa and had created a thriving and booming economy, which included a financial district in Greenwood that was then known as, quote, Negro Wall Street, now more commonly referred to as Black Wall Street. Black people in Tulsa during the 10s and 20s were some of the wealthiest members of the community. They had the highest priced and most opulent buildings. A thriving banking system and speculative activities in the region created a boomtown feel. Among the countless setbacks for freed blacks in the United States during the Jim Crow era, Tulsa stood as a beacon of progress and hope for what the future could hold. In May of 1921, all of that came to a crashing halt. On the claim that a black man assaulted a white woman, despite no evidence or charges, the man was held in a prison and a white mob quickly formed. As Mirsa Baradaran writes in The Color of Money, quote, the white mob set the city ablaze. By the time the destruction was over, 18,000 homes had been burned, 304 homes had been looted, 300 people, mostly black, had died, and many more injured, and two to three million dollars in property damage had occurred, including the lavishly built Zion Church, the heart of Black Greenwood, end quote. The wealth of black Tulsa residents was wiped out in a single and violent night. And as Ms. Fletcher would testify, it never returned. Not for her or her family, not for any of them. When the Civil War ended, black people in the United States possessed one half of 1% of all the wealth in the country. Today, that figure is 1%. That's how far we've made it, or haven't. What transpired between then and now is a symbolic extension of what happened in May of 1921, not always on such a fiery and grand scale, but it happened consistently over and over, decade by decade. Every inch of black economic progress and mobility was met with systemic, institutional, and structural barriers erected for the express purpose of suppressing black people in America. Now, contrary to popular sentiment, it wasn't only in the South, it was also in the North and then exported west during expansion. This wasn't a Southern thing. It was an American thing. As de Tocqueville wrote upon visiting America, quote, the prejudice of race appears to be stronger in the states that have abolished slavery than in those where it still exists. And nowhere is it so intolerant as in those states where servitude has never been known, end quote. 40 acres and a mule, as the saying goes. It's also the name of Spike Lee's production company. This was the first broken economic promise in a long line of broken promises. At the conclusion of the Civil War, President Lincoln acted on a gesture from a Union general who apportioned conquered plantations and land in the westward expansion to freedmen, recently emancipated enslaved people. Freedmen were to be deeded 40 acres to build their lives. They were, after all, the most skilled agricultural laborers. The mule thing is more legend as there were stray mules after the war that were given as property to a number of the freedmen. The period known as Reconstruction when this and other promises were made was very brief. Nearly all of it was undone immediately by President Andrew Johnson, a devout racist. Southern separatists were all pardoned and those who had their land confiscated had it returned. At this point, a series of new ordinances, followed by state laws and then federal laws, were passed to ensure that any post-war reparations and economic advantages were given exclusively to white people. Laws such as the Homestead Act that encouraged white settlers to move west with southern states forbidding the sale of land to black people. So building wealth through land ownership was out. Black people were therefore forced to resume their labor activities, although this time they were part of the market and could command a wage, even if it was paltry compared to their white working counterparts. 
What to do with their wages was another question entirely as black people had never banked before. So a new movement was sparked. A movement that every single black leader, including Frederick Douglass, Booker T. Washington, and W.E.B. Du Bois, to Martin Luther King Jr., Marcus Garvey, Malcolm X, and Jesse Jackson would promote. A movement that would be aided and promoted by multiple presidents from Abraham Lincoln and Teddy Roosevelt to Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon, and even to Ronald Reagan and Jimmy Carter. If black people were going to get ahead, they needed to, quote, keep their money black. The Freedman Bank, established by President Lincoln, was the first attempt at creating a black banking system and economy. It gathered pensions from deceased black soldiers and encouraged freedmen from around the country to pool deposits there, and they did. Small businesses, farms, churches, individuals, all poured money into the bank, and within a decade, it had more than $75 million in deposits. The crucial point here is that the bank was established as a savings bank and not a lending institution. White trustees were then placed in charge of the fast-growing bank to, you know, safeguard it and help build wealth for Southern blacks to build their lives with their newfound freedom. Unfortunately, that's not how wealth is built, and it's not how banks make money. Banks make money on lending, not saving. So over time, the bank's leadership changed and new trustees began to gamble in speculative ventures and push toward expansion. And for a while, it looked like things were working. But remember, this is during the beginning of industrialization and modern capitalism. There were no bailouts, no FDIC, no guarantors. And eventually, the speculative forces of the bank changed it into an investment bank to finance riskier and riskier endeavors, most notably railroad construction. And soon, other banks began to move their garbage investments to the Freedman balance sheet. And then, along came the panic of 1873, and everything started to unravel. At one point, even the great Frederick Douglass was appointed as head of the bank as a sign of strength. Of course, he knew next to nothing about banking, and it was just a show. The white speculators had already pilfered the bank's assets and loaded it with horrible bullshit paper. And by the next year, the bank was lost. And along with it, Half of the accumulated black wealth in the nation. Half. It would be years before black Americans even trusted the American banking system again. And when they did, they would repeat the mistakes of the past and continue to lose wealth time and time again. Panic after panic, recession after recession. Rinse and repeat. The True Reformers Bank, once called the Gibraltar of Negro business, was founded in 1888 and folded in 1910. The Alabama Penny Savings and Loan Company was founded in 1890 and failed in 1915 after a run on the bank. Nearly every black bank through history was destined to fail. But why? And why did it happen even after we had Keynesian protections in place in the latter years of the Depression to prevent the loss of deposits? If banks are banks and money is money, why did black banks fail while others survived? Well, let's run through a 100-year highlight reel to find out. The country was still raw from the Civil War, and the South was steadily losing its economic edge to the North, and the oil and gas and mining discoveries out West. States were increasingly devising laws and ordinances to prevent black families from acquiring property, moving from black neighborhoods, owning businesses, or getting government work. From the Color of Law by Richard Rothstein. Quote, in 1910, Baltimore adopted an ordinance prohibiting African Americans from buying homes on blocks where whites were a majority and vice versa. End quote. The Roaring Twenties. The stock market was flying high and speculators were getting very, very wealthy in all corners of the bursting American economy. White landowners were amassing enormous tracts of land and building cities with gusto. Unfortunately, black families were specifically locked out of this newfound economic and physical mobility. Again, from the color of law. Quote, in 1926, Indianapolis adopted a regulation permitting African Americans to move to a white area only if a majority of white residents gave their written consent. In Florida, a West Palm Beach racial zoning ordinance was adopted in 1929 and was maintained until 1960, end quote. So these are just one-off examples of zoning laws that popped up everywhere to preclude black families from moving out of their neighborhoods. And I selected these to demonstrate that these laws weren't just Southern. They were the law of the land, all of the land. What goes up must come down. 
We all know what happened next as the nation and the world fell into the Great Depression. We'll spend more time in the 30s now because the nation's policy response during the Depression would devastate the black community long after the rest of the nation recovered after World War II. From the turn of the century, through the crash and subsequent depression, black banks actually began to flourish despite the barriers put in place for land acquisition and mobility. Keep the money black was the mantra, and that's exactly what happened. What was made in the black community remained there, which was both a blessing and ultimately a curse. For example, John D. Rockefeller established the Dunbar Bank to, quote, help the Negro help himself by taking deposits in New York. But the bank was designed to be risk-averse, And so instead of investing in real estate and other business or home loans, it put the deposits into treasuries, you know, for safekeeping, like any good white patrician would do. Rockefeller promised that half of the shares of the bank would ultimately go to the community, but instead, he just held on to all of it. The one big project it managed to do was build a residential cooperative where black people could earn into ownership of real estate. Great. But Rockefeller eventually tired of this initiative during the Depression. He foreclosed on the cooperative and then shuttered the bank in 1938. From the color of money, quote, From 1900 until 1934, some 130 black banks came into being, 88 of which were formed between 1900 and 1928. The titans of black finance in the North were both located in Chicago. The Binga State Bank and the Douglas National Bank At their peak in 1928, they controlled almost one-third of the combined resources of all black banks in the country. Binga's bank was the first in Chicago to fail during the Great Depression, end quote. So the reason Binga failed when some of the others didn't is because the clearinghouse it belonged to rejected its request for an extension of credit during the initial shock of the crash. From the color of law, quote, all of the other banks that belonged to this clearinghouse were given aid and survived the Great Depression. On July 31, 1930, Illinois bank auditors closed Binga's bank and his depositors lost most of their savings, end quote. The Douglas National Bank, which had $2 million in assets prior to the crash, was the only black bank that was chartered as a national bank. It, too, failed after receiving no support. So aside from Rockefeller's soon-to-fail Dunbar Bank, New York had almost no black banks because New York's regulators continually prevented and blocked black bank charter applications. In fact, the Chelsea Bank, a white competitor downtown, was responsible for preventing most of the charters because it was the bank that took most of Harlem's deposits and yet made no loans back into the community. So through the 1920s, Harlem's wealth was used to finance white projects elsewhere in the city. Beyond banking, this was also the era of massive financial and economic reform, as Franklin Roosevelt threw everything against the wall to salvage the American economy. And one of the most prominent and enduring examples of systemic, structural, and institutional racism came from a 1933 act that created the Homeowners Loan Corporation, HOLC, to rescue homeowners from defaulting on their mortgages. So the idea was to buy the troubled mortgages and reissue them with longer and more favorable terms to prevent people from being thrown out onto the street. Now, in order to determine which houses were in need of saving, the HOLC hired local realtors to appraise properties. So they created color-coded maps for every city in the nation with green lines demarking the good areas and red lines demarking the bad. And we all know what they meant by bad. Thus, the term redlining was born. Another of the reforms was the introduction of the Federal Housing Administration, or FHA, in 1934. The FHA's 1939 underwriting manual explicitly prohibited lending in neighborhoods that were, quote, changing in racial composition. Naturally, the FHA utilized the maps drawn by agents of the HOLC. Yet another protection put in place to prevent banks from failing in the future was the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, or FDIC, designed to insure banks against potential runs. This was especially important to banks that had high exposure as savings and depository institutions that did few property and commercial loans. Now, this remains one of the most important protections in our system today, and it was actually lobbied for by the southern states, who also demanded Glass-Steagall prohibit conglomeration, mergers, or even banks branching across state lines. See, the fear was that northern banks, which were stronger by nature, would eventually take over the country and push out the states. 
In order to get the FDIC chartered, however, banks had to hold a minimum amount of capital and submit to routine examinations. And the rules were designed in such a way that chartering was done on a state level and thresholds that were set deliberately created an excuse for the FDIC to deny black-run banks. This left the country in a situation for decades where every subsequent reform pushed black-run banks further into a corner. They had to stay within their boundaries, had difficulty even getting charters, and then were denied access to the FDIC for lack of charters and capital requirements, and then excluded from the FHA provisions deliberately, so lending at scale wasn't an option. Even in the cities, the black community would be blocked at every turn. For example, in 1942, Metropolitan Life embarked on a project to build a 9,000-unit Stuyvesant Town housing complex on the east side of Manhattan. To make way for Stuytown, the city cleared 18 city blocks and transferred the area to MetLife along with a multi-decade tax abatement. But the project was designated for whites only, despite this now being illegal under federal law. And by the time the company was compelled to change their policy in the courts, every single apartment in the development was filled. This was during a time when the nation was at war, and more than a million black Americans fought abroad for U.S. interests. And of course, when they returned home, little had changed. But hope was on the horizon. One of Roosevelt's last major legislative accomplishments was the passage of the GI Bill, which would assist returning veterans in myriad ways, including a mortgage guarantee. For the 1.2 million returning black veterans, this finally offered the promise of home ownership outside of American urban landscapes. Now, while the bill didn't specifically exclude African Americans from securing its benefits, the filibuster did in a roundabout way. See, Southern racists filibustered the bill until a provision was included that allowed states to administer benefits, such as mortgages. Then once the federal government lost control of the administration of benefits, the bill was basically DOA for black Americans who were turned away almost universally by states and municipalities. As Adam Gentleson writes in Kill Switch, which details the racist use of the filibuster in the Senate, Quote, in the 87 years between the end of Reconstruction and 1964, the only bills that were stopped by filibusters were civil rights bills, end quote. Gentleson rightly notes that Southern Democrats ran circles around well-intentioned Northerners through the use of the filibuster, especially during the New Deal era, because, for the most part, they were aligned with Roosevelt. They were in favor of redistributing wealth, just only to white people. By 1950, the FHA and VA together were insuring half of all mortgages nationwide. The rest of white American homeowners were able to secure more conventional loans. As for black home buyers, well, there was another option. Again, from The Color of Money. Quote, for scores of developments across the nation, the plans reviewed by the FHA included the approved construction materials, the design specifications, the proposed sale price, the neighborhood zoning restrictions, and a commitment not to sell to African Americans. With half of the home loans being issued by agencies that excluded black participation, a new market sprung up to fill the void. After all, everyone was working in America at the time, which meant that black people were just as employed as whites. The only difference was the only option that they had to store their earnings and accumulate wealth was through small interest on savings. Because they were working and desired home ownership like everyone else, the new market that came along was something called contract selling. These were basically leases with options to buy that had punitive interest rates and penalties for late payments as extreme as total loss. By the 50s, 85% of the homes sold in Chicago to black families were sold on such contracts. With abundant employment, the seeds of wealth appreciation through home ownership and a booming economy, white America was sitting pretty and things were about to get even better with access to greater purchasing power. Well, for white men at least, credit cards. The shift from installment payments to revolving credit lines was a revolution that cannot be overstated. It freed up capital and increased the velocity of spending like never before. The only people who weren't using credit to finance their lives by the end of the 1950s were either really rich or black. Rich because they didn't need to. Black because they weren't allowed to. In 1962, with federal urban renewal funds, Detroit began to demolish African-American neighborhoods. The first project cleared land for expansion of a Chrysler automotive manufacturing plant. 
Then, federal dollars were used to raise more homes to make way for the Chrysler Expressway, I-75, leading to the plant. In advance, the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights had warned that the expressway would displace about 4,000 families, 87% of whom were African American. In Camden, New Jersey, an interstate highway destroyed some 3,000 low-income housing units from 1963 to 1967. So believe it or not, Richard Nixon was actually welcomed with pretty generous support in the black community initially, despite the distrust that he personally engendered. See, Nixon was nothing if not shrewd, and he began to speak the language of what we now know is the so-called Southern strategy. Shift the conversation away from blatantly racist tactics and fear-mongering and leverage the coded language of economic dislocation and inherent racism. But for many in the black community, this was exactly the pivot that they were looking for. See, on the heels of Dr. King's assassination and the brief victories of the civil rights movement, black leaders were looking for a way to build on their legislative capital and create economic capital. As far as they were concerned, the more the government left them the fuck alone, the better. Now, in practice, Nixon did leave them alone as he steadily began to walk back many of Johnson's great society programs. And clever little dick that he was, he made this look magnanimous by shifting the strategy to support black businesses and banking, but mostly in a rhetorical and performative fashion. See, for example, in 1969, he created the Office of Minority Business Enterprise, OMBE, within the Department of Commerce. Now, the OMBE was not allocated any direct funds, but it was instructed to seek private business contributions and help from other federal agencies. It was given responsibility for advising, encouraging, mobilizing, evaluating, collecting information, and coordinating activities. It told Horatio Alger-like stories about black business people and little else. Nixon's Equal Employment Opportunity Office was created to foster employment, but it was a voluntary program. So no one actually joined in. But hey, it was great PR for big business. Perhaps the most honest government report ever issued was something called the Kerner Report. I'm going to leave the rest of the 60s to this report, commissioned by LBJ and headed by Illinois Governor Otto Kerner. From 1950 to 1966, 77.8% of the white population increase of 35.6 million took place in the suburbs. Central cities received only 2.5% of this total white increase. Since 1960, white central city population has actually declined by 1.3 million. As a result, central cities are steadily becoming more heavily Negro, while the urban fringes around them remain almost entirely white. As the whites were absorbed by the larger society, many left their predominantly ethnic neighborhoods and moved to outlying areas to obtain newer housing and better schools. Some scattered randomly over the suburban area. Others established new ethnic clusters in the suburbs, but even these rarely contained solely members of a single ethnic group. As a result, most middle-class neighborhoods, both in the suburbs and within central cities, have no distinctive ethnic character, except that they are white. Nowhere has the expansion of America's urban Negro population followed this pattern of dispersal. Thousands of Negro families have attained incomes, living standards, and cultural levels matching or surpassing those of whites who have, quote, upgraded themselves from distinctly ethnic neighborhoods. Yet, most Negro families have remained within predominantly Negro neighborhoods, primarily because they have been effectively excluded from white residential areas, end quote. So by the end of the 60s, despite the gains of the civil rights movement, and just as it happened after Reconstruction, black people in America were relegated to urban ghettos, excluded from participating in the most prosperous decades in human history, paying more for crappier homes, buying things on installment instead of credit, and saving very little. Nixon's OMBE launched an investment initiative to extend credit to minority businesses in 1970. The fund was bankrupt within the year. The 1974 Fair Credit Reporting Act officially put an end to racial and gender discrimination by credit card companies. And while it worked for women who were basically locked out of credit cards until this point, the lenders skirted the regulations for ethnic minorities by simply carving out certain zip codes. Free market ideals began to take root with people like Alan Greenspan, 
who wrote that capitalism was under attack by black militants and said that, quote, the charge of exploitation in the sense of value being extracted from the Negroes without their consent for the profit of the whites is clearly false, end quote. See, Greenspan had to say this. Otherwise, the entire premise of free markets and invisible hands comes crashing down in the face of the biggest market force in the United States, racism. By 1971, the SBA had allocated $66 million in federal contracts to minority firms, one-tenth of one percent of the $76 billion in total federal government contracts that year. Multiple studies revealed that 20% of these set-asides had gone to white-owned firms. Welfare queens, tax cuts, trickle down. By the mid-80s, middle-class black families had one-fifth of the wealth of white families and half of black children were in poverty. And yet the war on welfare began in earnest with Reagan determined to take back any and every subsidy or program that supported poor families. A 1991 study by the Federal Reserve found widespread discrimination in home mortgages with black owners being disproportionately sold subprime loans even if they qualified for conventional ones. This was the era that saw the explosion of subprime mortgages. Wall Street had already figured out that they could bundle mortgages into pools of investments called mortgage-backed securities, an incredible innovation that led to a massive spike in home loan originations because the packages spread the liability and were remarkably stable. So stable that Wall Street created something called a collateralized debt obligation, or CDO, that gambled on these packages even further by allowing them to be leveraged. And as you now know, the whole thing was predicated on an influx of new mortgages, so the mortgage industry once again found its prey in the black communities and created an even deeper and bigger pool of subprime lending. And you know how the story ended. Even the black families who qualified for conventional loans were pushed towards subprime loans in a coordinated effort by mortgage brokers who didn't have to worry about holding the loans on their balance sheets. So they needed to make more money on origination fees and higher punitive interest rates so they carried more value when they sold them. I mean, seriously, what could have gone wrong? And to really put a fine point on the 1990s, go to our mass incarceration episode, which details the rise of incarcerated black men and women in the United States at the hands of the Clinton administration. Or go read The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. Millions of black men and women were taken off the streets and stripped of their ability to participate in either our democracy or the modern economy for low-level nonviolent crimes that ensured that a new generation of black Americans would once again start from scratch with no inherited wealth or structure to stand on. And so here we are. Dot-com bubble bursts, and then a brief recession, and then 9-11, and then W pours money on the deficits and keeps those tax cuts rolling, builds on the war economy, lets Wall Street do whatever the fuck it wants until the wheels come off like a car doing 120 down I-95. Yes, I'm talking about the financial crisis. The financial crisis wiped out 53% of total black wealth. 53%. The protracted recovery, stymied by neoliberal caution and a Republican Congress, determined to cut our first black president off at the knees at every fucking turn, meant that the black community would recover even more slowly. But hey, at least we have a black president, right? I mean, he made it, you can too. Except that this black president was the son of a mixed race marriage whose white grandparents studied on the GI Bill, bought a house through the FHA, and moved to Hawaii. And so we're left in a situation where black families have an average net wealth of $11,000 compared to a white family's average of $141,000. Or as Pew Research puts it, quote, white families have 13 times more wealth than black families, end quote. And of course, the most recent statistics are coming in from Pew, the St. Louis Fed, Brookings, and others that depict the obvious from the pandemic, that it was disproportionately brutal on black and Hispanic communities. So there you go. A hundred years of fuckery delivered to one group and one group only. There are so many corollaries and tributaries of this kind of mass scale, coordinated economic dislocation. We didn't even touch on gentrification. Like when an area gets hot, white people will use their economic power to purchase property, change zoning laws, condemn properties, and do whatever they want to improve a neighborhood. Then there are schools and education. 
The education gap between blacks and whites in this country is staggering, and it all stems from the state's rights notion that local municipalities should control tax dollars for education rather than having an equitable distribution of dollars at a state or federal level. And the result is a disparity in funding between white neighborhoods that enjoy a more than a century of economic development and opportunity and black neighborhoods that experience the opposite. Every door that you open has just a torrent of bullshit like the ones that we went through today. And not all of it is economic or political or structural. Some of it is societal. I mean, black families were discouraged from moving into white neighborhoods by realtors, mortgage companies, and homeowners associations as well. Or they just didn't qualify for homeownership programs made available to white populations, even if there was income parity between them. And if they were somehow able to overcome all of these obstacles, oftentimes they were met with violence from their would-be neighbors. Garbage thrown on their lawns, crosses burned on them, even in the North. Ridicule and exclusion from community gatherings and activities. To people like Milton Friedman and other pull-yourself-up-by-the-bootstraps economists, these were social factors that were inconsequential to them because they frustrated the political and social realities of their pristine economic models. Think about something as basic as the price of food. Now, in the Kerner Report, they noted that, on the whole, food prices were relatively stable regardless of neighborhoods, income distribution, or class. However, they opened another door. They went one step further and looked at purchasing habits. Because densely populated ghettos at the time were generally what we now refer to as food deserts, meaning they don't have large-scale grocery stores, most community members were forced to shop at smaller local stores. First off, because they typically didn't have access to automobiles because they didn't have the credit to purchase them. So there's that. Further, because they had smaller incomes and less savings, so they shopped in smaller quantities. And the smaller the quantity, the smaller the discount. And because they were independent stores, the operators themselves typically had to mark these smaller quantity items up because they couldn't afford the purchasing advantage that the larger chains had, and so on and so on. You see how deep this gets, right? All of this explains the meaning behind words. Words like systemic, structural, and institutional. Words that accurately depict the economic and social circumstances that suppress the economic mobility of Black Americans and has been doing that since Reconstruction. The problem is that these explanations, as you see, take time and nuance and understanding to digest. Time that most people don't have to dedicate. And I really wish there was an easier way to go about this because it's just so much easier to read the headline and the bumper sticker. All right, so let's do the uncomfortable part. It's time to answer the questions that we posed up top. So the first one was, every other immigrant group in this country was able to break out of the ghetto within one generation. Why can't black people? Well, now we see that it's because they were prohibited entry to communities outside of the ghetto, first through violence, then through legislation and policy and then by their fellow citizens. It was death by acronym. The FHA, FDIC, GI Bill, VA, HOLC, all created and maintained policies to prevent black people from obtaining mortgages and credit and accessing the mechanisms of wealth building and preservation. So while the policies may have been eradicated, the practices remain to this day. The second one, it's easier in today's society to get ahead as a black person because they have all the advantages through affirmative action, whether it's college or jobs. So aside from the fact that affirmative action was struck down, the numbers are incorrect to begin with. The only ethnicity with larger education participation than their population ratio is the Asian population. So that means that the population that remains underrepresented in higher education compared to the proportion of the population is black people because the black community has less accumulated and inherited wealth and has been barred from participating in the broader economy outside of their community solely on the basis of their skin color. Here's an ugly one, and yes, people do say this out loud. Black people commit more crime and come from broken homes. They have to fix themselves. No one else can. I'm telling you, people say this shit. Okay. Black people commit crime at the same proportion as all other races, but they're more likely to be targeted and convicted of crimes than white people and then given longer, harsher sentences. So there's a greater proportion and representation of them within the criminal justice system. Slavery isn't an excuse anymore. Clean slate. Oh boy, 
A clean slate would require complete access to the housing market, a change in the way schools are funded, equitable access to broadband, low interest rate loans, and revolving credit. No historically marginalized group has broken the cycle of poverty without access to these mechanisms, and no group outside of the black community has been systemically, legislatively, violently, and purposefully excluded from doing so. None. One of their own became president, so they can't complain anymore, and they've got another on the ballot right now. President Obama is the ultimate Horatio Alger story, but even his is a story of access through his white grandparents who availed themselves of the mechanisms of wealth and access established in the New Deal. I worked my ass off to get here, and they just look for handouts. People say this a lot more than you realize. Well, white people receive more handouts than black people, and throughout history have built great wealth through government programs and subsidies denied to black people through legislation, official and unofficial policies and behavior. When given the same opportunity historically as white people, black people have demonstrated an equal ability to acquire wealth and build communities. The difference is that white people actively burn them to the ground, as in the case of Tulsa, quite literally. And my least favorite one, they need to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. To paraphrase the good Dr. King, you can't pull yourself up by the bootstraps if you don't have any boots. So this leads me to a conclusion that is like half obvious and half not. Since the Civil War, black people in America have enjoyed access to all of the benefits of society and government for about 10 years total. The handful of years post-emancipation and prior to Jim Crow laws and Southern codes and the period between the Civil Rights and the Voting Rights Act and the election of Richard Nixon. That's it. The rest of US history belongs entirely to white society. Black leaders throughout history got it wrong on matters of finance and banking. And this was the hardest part for me to wrap my mind around. Keeping money black and building black banks inside black communities was a trap a trap that guaranteed that credit and income appreciation were off the table, and banks would remain undercapitalized and fragile. To participate in the broader economy, the black community has to look beyond its own ability to bank and create access to capital and credit. This is finally beginning to happen. In black entrepreneurship, there's a lot of discussion about this, and it's a trend that needs to continue. So the black community has to be able to retain cultural heritage while assimilating its finances into a broader system so that it's harder for the white economic establishment and political leaders to isolate it and crush it through violence, policy, or both. The one commonality between the post-emancipation and civil rights movement is that these brief periods were forged in revolution and upheaval, war and riots. So the only reasonable conclusion that one can draw from this is that the only way for the black community to move forward is revolt. It's the only thing that appears to work, right? Even though the results are temporary. But no one wants that, least of all, the black community. So the real answer is reparations. Even if the idea of bulk payments to ancestors of enslaved people is a bridge too far for you, there are other ways to go about this. Funds set aside for black and native peoples for housing down payments. Establish a federally backed insurance guarantee corporation to undergird a revolving low interest rate credit market for black and native people and federally refinance student loans below the federal funds rate. And then there are the broader economic measures that would uplift all poor and working class families, such as direct payments per child instead of a credit classifying broadband as a utility to guarantee access to high-speed internet. Racists feed on othering to explain their own misfortune. Can't find a job? It's easier to blame an immigrant than it is to blame the corporate class. Suffering under massive and expensive debt, living paycheck to paycheck? It's a lot easier to blame handouts to ethnic minorities than it is to blame the corporate class. Now, it's unlikely that we'll ever cure prejudice, but racism is a product of dissatisfaction, disillusionment, and disenfranchisement. And you know what they result in? Donald Trump. See, these are states of being encouraged by the oligarchy because they pit us against one another. So we look away from the historic theft of wealth from the working class. Eliminate these conditions, and it defangs the mechanisms that turn prejudice into racism. See, if we're all doing better, then there's less of an impulse to scapegoat. <laughs>
Here endeth the lesson. For a complete list of sources and resources for this episode and all the work that we do, go to unftr.com. There you can find a way to sign up for our free weekly newsletter, browse our directory of progressive resources, and find links to all of the articles and materials that we've published, whether it's the podcast or on the website. Thanks again for supporting us. Please remember to like and subscribe to the channel because it really helps out. And if you're so inclined, consider becoming a member of the show. Thanks so much, and we'll see you in the next one.